Welcome to worship with Ascension Lutheran Church in beautiful Nelson, BC. Today is June 11th and the second Sunday after Pentecost. We are entering into the second half of our church year and it's the season of green, a time when we focus on growing our faith. Many of us are also growing our gardens during this green season. Today's worship service will have hymns, lessons, prayers, special music and a sermon. Some of us will worship gathered in our new building. Some of us will worship at home through this video. No matter where we are, we are together in spirit and we're really glad you're here. Welcome here. You are called into the love of God. Our creator, redeemer, and sustainer embraces you. Amen. Let us pray. Praise and thanks to you, holy God of creation and life. Even though she laughed, you spoke life into Sarah's womb. Through faith, Abraham became the father of many nations. For your life-giving word, O God, we give you thanks and praise. Through Christ, your word incarnate, you speak to us today and inspire us to faith. We find hope and promise given in parable and story, abundance found in loaves and fish, calm found on stormy waters. For your life-giving word, O God, we give you thanks and praise. Through the Spirit, you call out to your people. You take our heavy burdens, granting us yokes that are easy and light, and giving us visions of the kingdom. For your life-giving word, O God, we give you thanks and praise. Restore and renew us, Lord, and open our hearts to your mercy and forgiveness. Accomplish in us the work of your creation through your life-giving word, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Today's first reading is from Hebrew scripture and it reminds us of God's grace. The reading has some dialogue between the actions of a person, in this case, the prophet, and the way in which God responds or reacts to that activity. 
what it's really saying is that we may be inclined naturally to be combative people. But this old prophet spoke against adversity. And in this lesson from the natural world, he points out this conflict that we experience between our natural tendencies and the way in which God would have us be based on the way in which God is towards us, that is, gracious. Reading then from the fifth chapter of the prophet Hosea, beginning at verse 15, through to chapter 6, verse 6. I will return again to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face. In their distress, they will beg my favor Come, let us return to the Lord, for it is he who has torn and he will heal us. He has struck down and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live before him. Let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. His appearing is as sure as the dawn. He will come to us like the showers, like the spring rains that water the earth. What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? Your love is like a morning cloud, like the dew that goes away early. Therefore I have hewn them by the prophets. I have killed them by the words of my mouth, and my judgment goes forth as the light. For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice the knowledge of God, rather than burnt offerings. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. Oh, oh, oh. 
In our lives, rules create order. Rules also often stir up antagonists. But can opposition lead towards cooperation? Faith and trust lead to mutuality so that creative lives are possible. Ancient Abraham's story tells how change can lead to kinship. As we read in Romans, the fourth chapter, beginning at verse 13 and going to the end of the chapter. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath. But where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, and not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of all of us, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said, so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distress made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words it was reckoned to him were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses, and was raised for our justification. May the church hear what the Spirit is saying. Amen. Gospel for the second Sunday after Pentecost, recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, the ninth chapter, beginning at verse 9. Glory be to you, O Lord. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. While he was saying these things to them, suddenly a leader of the synagogue came in and knelt before him saying, my daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. And Jesus got up and followed him with his disciples. Then suddenly a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak, for she said to herself, 
If I only touch his cloak, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. When Jesus came to the leader's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, go away. For the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl got up. And the report of this spread throughout that district. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace in the name of the one we call Jesus the Christ. In today's gospel reading, we discover that the lectionary combines the first gospel's account of Matthew's call with the stories of healing of the woman with the hemorrhage and the synagogue leader's daughter. Sandwiched between these two stories is Jesus insisting that old garments and old wineskins cannot withstand new cloth and new wineskins. Both passages of scripture provide us with grist for reflection upon the nature of ministry, that of Jesus, as well as that of us, the church. Jesus calls Matthew to follow him, yet Jesus follows Matthew and the sinners to the table. Meanwhile, the desperate leader, a father, and the suffering woman prevail upon Jesus to win his touch. Jesus reaches out to the tax collector, but he finds himself apprehended by those seeking his healing touch. So it may be with the church's ministry. Sometimes we go forth and identify ourselves with those on the margins. And in other cases, the needs of others draw us, the faith community, beyond comfortable boundaries. Perhaps like the Jesus of the first gospel, the church needs to cultivate the art of following. In our reading, the first gospel relates the call of Matthew, not Levi as in Mark. We don't know why. And the writer describes Matthew as seated at his tax collector station. Jesus calls Matthew to follow him. As it turns out, he even accepts hospitality in Matthew's house. There, Jesus shares a table with his typical crowd, tax collectors and sinners. Several rabbinic sources indicate tax collectors' wicked reputation. But this story shares all we really need to know. The Pharisees perceive tax collectors and sinners as natural companions. And Jesus himself compares them not to those who are well, but to those who are sick. Jesus is notorious for his companionship with tax collectors and sinners in the first gospel, a tradition that likely goes back to Jesus himself. His opponents scorn the company that Jesus keeps. Yet Jesus makes much of these tax collectors. When Jesus tells his disciples to love their enemies, he notes that even the tax collectors love those who love them. And later on, Jesus admonishes the church to relate to unrepentant sinners as if they were Gentiles or <gasps> even tax collectors. And again, confronted by hostile temple authorities, Jesus puts them in their place. Even tax collectors and prostitutes enter the realm of heaven before these enemies who speak the will of God, but do not live it out. Jesus says the healthy do not need a physician, while the sick do, and that he has come to call not the righteous, but sinners. Yet Jesus' companionship with sinners appears to be just that, companionship not treatment. Jesus has many harsh words to say in the first gospel, but you know he directs none of them at sinners. 
His very first message is a call to repent in chapter 4, and he denounces the cities he is visiting for failing to repent in chapter 11. He pronounces woe against the scribes and the Pharisees come chapter 23. But in this first gospel that is attributed to Matthew, Jesus not once reproves sinners. He neither criticizes them or demands their repentance. He simply eats and drinks with them. You know, Jesus often receives credit for touching a woman with a bloody discharge and for touching a dead girl's body. According to this preaching tradition, by doing so, Jesus, who was a faithful Jew, reaches across Israel's purity codes. More recent scholars recognize that Jesus does not actually transgress or break the law in either instance, but he does touch ritual impurity. Regardless, I mean, the thing is, Jesus initiates neither contact with the woman or the girl. Once again, in today's stories, he's practicing the art of following. The synagogue leader, the girl's father, is the one to suggest that Jesus lay your hand upon her. Jesus does eventually touch the girl, restoring her to life, but not before the hemorrhaging woman sneaks up and touches Jesus first. She, not he, crosses the boundary between purity and impurity and does the unthinkable. She, not Jesus, proves that purity is more contagious than impurity. Could it be that the girl's father and the hemorrhaging woman draw Jesus out to this ministry of touching? Sometimes the church needs to learn the art of following, of being drawn out, as Jesus does in Matthew's gospel. During the civil rights movement, some white liberals acted as heroes, risking social standing, employment, even bodily safety for the cause of justice. I have to tell you, their stories inspire me. Yet most of them did not seek out the cause of racial justice. Rather, it found them. A particular incident opened their eyes to the harsh truth, or a specific crisis called them to action. And then, sometimes slowly, sometimes reluctantly, and usually hesitantly, they moved forward. Confronted with the leadership and the suffering of African Americans, some, but not all white liberals, joined the cause. As in many of the healing stories of Jesus, they were heroes, not because they sought out the opportunity for healing, but because they responded to the call set before them. Today, what is the call set out before us? How do we, like the Jesus of the first gospel, need to learn how to follow? How do we make room for new wine and new wineskins? June marks National Indigenous History Month, as well as it being Pride Month. I see so many parallels between the civil rights movement and the call before us to address the historical and ongoing injustice meted out towards both the LGBTQ plus community and the indigenous community. Though our Lutheran church since 2011 has made it possible for our congregations to be welcoming spaces for all, regardless of sexual orientation and gender identity, including the calling of gay clergy and the marriage of gay couples, and our Lutheran church apologized at the Truth and Reconciliation Gathering in 2014 in Edmonton for the injustices of the past, and I know that because I was there, and acknowledged the harm of the doctrine of discovery in 2017, certainly we all realize the work is not done. Hate crimes continue towards those who identify on the rainbow spectrum, particularly 
those who identify as transgender. And there are still way too many indigenous communities that don't have fresh water and inadequate schooling resources compared to the rest of Canada. Indigenous women and girls are still being targeted, abused, and killed. And our prisons are disproportionately populated with too many Indigenous men and women. What is the call set out before us as church? To be about justice. Where do we need to learn to follow? Like Jesus did. We also find these words in this morning's reading. Jesus said, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. May these words guide us as we hear God's call upon our lives today. Amen. Please join me as we affirm the faith into which we were baptized using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, the God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Trusting in God's abundant mercy, let us offer our prayers for a world in need. Using the words, God in your mercy, you are invited to respond, hear our prayer. We pray, O God, for the church. Unite us with any on the margins, that the whole world recognizes that your mercy is greater than our human capacity to restrict it. We pray for our sister churches in the BC Synod, Chetwin's Shared Ministry in Chetwind, Christ Lutheran in Chilliwack, and their pastor, Dean Anderson. We pray also for our congregation here at Ascension and our own Pastor Brenda. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, O oh God, for creation. Tend forests and fields and safeguard all animals, domestic and wild. Preserve lakes, rivers, oceans, and send rains to water the earth. Revive lands recovering from natural disasters such as wildfires and floods. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, O oh God, for all those who are in need. Accompany anyone enduring chronic illness, those who suffer in secret, those grieving a loved one's death. Send healing for all who plead for relief from sickness or pain. Especially today we remember Mary Ann, Kim, Judy, Anne, Mary Ann M, Fern, and Jen. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, O oh God, for the nations. Awaken in our leaders compassion for people 
who have too often felt forgotten or neglected. Inspire policy solutions that bring peace and equity. Be especially with the people of Ukraine and the people of Sudan. Be with the LGBTQ community in Uganda as they face oppression from their leadership. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, O oh God, for the eradication of racial hatred. On this week, when we commemorate the Emmanuel Nine, the nine people who were shot during a Bible study in Charleston, South Carolina, we implore you to cast out the demons of white supremacy that make us believe lies about ourselves and our neighbors. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Be with us as we live our mission as a community of Christians, empowered by the grace of God through word and sacrament to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with God. Receive our prayers and answer us, O God, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please join me in the prayer that Jesus taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Receive these words of blessing. The God who calls across the cosmos and speaks in the smallest seed, bless, keep, and sustain you now and to the end of the age. Amen. Go in peace. Share the good news. Thanks be to God.